All right. Hey, good morning again, guys. Glad to have you here worshiping Jesus with us today. And uh, yeah, we got a lot of good stuff to talk about in God's word. But first of all, just a few quick announcements. Um, The first one is, uh, hey, if you want a uh, Hub City Church t-shirt, we are going to have more of those coming. So uh, we've been being asked by people, hey, are there more of those? No, they're not. Because what we do is we take an order ahead of time and then we order exactly what we need. So if you want one, you can have one. Uh, the order form uh, is on our Facebook page and our social media stuff and the Church Center app. Um, they're going to be cool. We'll say the Hub City Church on them and stuff. So yeah, anyway, uh, we'd love for you to have one. It's good to have those. You know, if you want to serve with us downtown and things like that, way to um, represent who we are. So uh, just make sure you get your order in by the 16th because we'll be placing the order the very next day. So we do have those coming. If you have questions about that, um, just let us no. Um, the next thing is fall schedule uh, has rolled out this past week. We'll post about that on social media again this upcoming week, but we have lots of things in store. Uh, membership class, business meeting, uh, fall work day, fall fest, which we love having fun in the backyard together, uh, chili cook off and all that good stuff. And then we will have our Thanksgiving outreach as well. Uh, there's probably a lot of unofficial, uh, less official things that'll be going on as well this fall. So please make sure Uh, to stay tuned and join us for all of those good things we're doing together. Uh, And then the last thing I have is that uh, community groups are starting back. So yeah, yep, Uh, ours are starting back today. And uh, just talk with your community group leader if you have one. They'll let you know when that's starting back if they haven't done that already. Um, And yeah, if you're not a part of a community group, we'd love to have you. So just let us know uh, at the end of the service or you can go online and you can uh, fill out the, the community group interest form and we will get in contact with you and get you connected. All right. Well, uh, we are currently in a teaching series through the Old Testament book of Daniel. And uh, please, uh, if you're just now joining us and maybe you're less familiar with the Old Testament storyline, I encourage you to go back and check out the first three uh, sermons that came before this one for sake of context. Uh, Those are all on our YouTube channel and our uh, Apple podcast and everything. So, uh, but in short, Daniel is uh, a young Israelite who has been exiled in the ancient kingdom of Babylon, 700 miles away from his home, because as an act of God's discipline on the collective sin of his people, Israel, he allowed them to be militarily conquered by Babylon, who was the greatest uh, geopolitical power of the 6th century, Uh, and then for many of them to be taken into Babylonian captivity for a period of 70 years. Daniel uh, would have been a teenager at this time, and so while he is not sinless, uh, he is to a certain degree uh, innocent in respect to uh, all, of this, all of this that's taking place, and yet from the world's perspective, he falls victim to uh, enslavement by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to begin studying in order to serve in his royal court of eunuchs as an advisor. Now, I say that Daniel uh, was only a victim from the world's perspective because as we begin to see very quickly in chapter 2 last week, uh, though this is a sad and an awful situation for Daniel to be in, God is undeniably with Daniel, and God intends to use Daniel for the good of Babylon and the good of King Nebuchadnezzar as a way of showcasing his wisdom and glory as the one true God amidst the sea of idols or false gods. And the way this happens uh, is that God gives a dream to King Nebuchadnezzar um, that in this dream, you know, even as the most powerful man in the world at that time, that terrifies King Nebuchadnezzar. And so he summons his council of pagan wise men to tell him what the dream was and to interpret what it meant. And when his wise men basically told the king um, in more words, hey, king, we can't read your mind, Okay, um, he grew suspicious of them, and as a result, he grew angry, and in his insecure, prideful fury, he decreed that all of the wise men should be rounded up and killed. So when they come for Daniel, Daniel appeals to the king's captain and to the king 
to not kill him and the other wise men, but to simply give him the night to pray and to ask for God's help. And due to uh, God's favor on Daniel, this request is granted. And then God graciously reveals the dream as well as its interpretation to Daniel. Daniel then responds by praying a beautiful, God-glorifying prayer of praise and thanksgiving to God. And then he begins making his way to go and stand before the king and speak truth to power, if you will. And uh, so that's where we're going to uh, pick it up this morning. So before we do, let's, um, let's take after our faithful friend Daniel. And before we begin, let's magnify the Lord and ask for his help as we set out to interpret his word. Let's pray. Father, you are good. You are glorious, and you are our God. So we simply begin by thanking you and praising you for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to us as the focal point of human history and really of all existence. Our kind, wise, good, and loving creator, as well as the one who has graciously revealed to us the mystery of how we as your fallen image bearers can come back into right relationship with you through faith alone and the perfect life, atoning death, and triumphant resurrection of your son Jesus. Thank you, God, for giving us your written word that is the perfect, inerrant, sufficient revelation of who you are and how we are to live our lives in light of what we now know about your incarnate word, our Savior, Lord and King Jesus. And now, God... As we turn back to your words to us through the prophet Daniel, would you by your spirit give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand and accept what you have written to us and how to rightly apply it to ourselves for spiritual growth and the maturity of our faith. I pray that we would both marvel at your sovereignty today as well as take great comfort in it. And find in it the humble confidence that we are called to walk in as Jesus' disciples in a crazy world that we know is passing away and needs to hear the good news that you have entrusted to us. As always, Lord, I pray that you would help me to say all that is right for me to say and nothing that is not, that you might increase and that I might decrease for the joy of those who are here this morning and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's go. Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to recap really quick here the end of Daniel's prayer, verse 23. He says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Now, before I start into verse 24, really quick, I didn't say this last week, but men, Um, notice Daniel's reference to God as the God of his fathers. Guys, I say this all the time, and I won't stop saying it because I keep needing to hear it too. Let us not delegate or brush off the God-given role that we have of spiritual headship in our homes. How we treat our wives, how we engage our kids, Consistently reading the Bible to them as they grow up, praying with them, letting them witness how we trust the Lord in all things. If we are faithful, brothers, if we are faithful, there is a much higher likelihood that one day when they are surrounded by a pagan culture 10 times worse than it is today and we can no longer be with them every step of the way to protect them, that our children too, like Daniel, will learn in the midst of life's difficulties to trust for themselves the God of their fathers. All right, but on to to today's text. Daniel prays, amen, verse 24. It says, Therefore Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers 
can show to the king the mystery the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to, the, to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Now, uh, years ago, the first time I was ever invited to speak a word in a gathered uh, congregational worship setting, uh, I was still living in Jacksonville. My pastor had asked me to do the offering talk, and so I prepared heavily, uh, pacing around my living room, (laughs) figuring out exactly what I thought I would say, how I would say it. I wrote it all out, and on Sunday morning, uh, when I got up to the stage, I looked around and immediately grew terrified, and I bombed, okay? Like, bombed. It was bad. I mean, like, someone could have said to me that line from Billy Madison, at no point in your rambling, incoherent response... (laughs) Were you even close to anything that be, could, be, could be considered a rational thought? And everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. So uh, becoming a full-time preaching pastor was only, I assure you, only by the doing of God. Because I was not born to be a public speaker. I'm still not great at it without notes. But anyway, man, Daniel, when he walks up to stand before this immensely powerful king, he clearly had no problem, right? And this king had no problem seeing Daniel murdered in cold blood 24 hours ago. But Daniel comes out the gate like a beast, right? Like articulate, unafraid to speak the truth in a matter-of-fact way. Remember, Daniel is only a youth. He could have easily only been like 17 years old. And I assure you that standing to speak to King Nebuchadnezzar was not easy. It was likely a daunting and uncomfortable experience. And yet Daniel, no doubt, empowered by the Holy Spirit, does it like it's no sweat. And so here's the first point I think that we can take uh, from this passage, church. We can live with confidence in crazy times. Because our God is sovereign even over our kings. Now, as it turns out, this situation with a a man of lowly stature standing confidently before a worldly king on behalf of God, uh, this is kind of a trend in Scripture. I don't know if you've read much, but uh, Joseph, Moses, and Aaron stood before the pharaohs. Nathan, Elijah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, the prophets, stood before the kings of Israel and Judah. Nehemiah and Ezra stood before the Persian king, Cyrus, and Artaxerxes. And even in the New Testament, John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, even Jesus himself stood and confidently spoke truth to the Roman governing powers of their day. And all of them were living in crazy times. Now, if you're anything like me, Uh, then you have a weird relationship with the news, okay? Like, you hate it, but you also kind of want to stay up on it and know what's going on uh, in the world. And so often, as I am reading or listening uh, to the news, I am thinking, (sighs) unbelievable. And as I hear about current events, my feelings tend to fall somewhere in the spectrum from sadness to frustration, because the world is crazy, and it is really dark, But while it is crazy out there, when I look to the Bible, I'm reminded that craziness and cultural darkness is not unprecedented. Right? In the the COVID era, all the news outlets wanted us to start believing that we were living in unprecedented times. Read the Bible. No, we're not. Okay? Like, and particularly when it comes to spiritually insecure, erratic pagan kings. We as the body of Christ have a heritage, a great cloud of witnesses who went before us, both men and women who have shown us what it looks like to be relatively unconcerned with who our, who their king was, because not only did they know who their God was, but they had a personal relationship with him and they knew that he was in sovereign control. So maybe you can 
tell where I'm going with this. So many are losing their minds this election season already. And while I'm not a prophet, I can guarantee you it's going to get worse before it gets better. Sadly, there are even professing Christians lining up on both sides of the aisle, engaging in foolish and undignified behavior, spewing all manner of mean-spirited rhetoric, and tarnishing their witness for Christ. Church, let us not get reeled in to that demonic dumpster fire. Let us not, okay? Remember, the spirit of Babylon in our day wants us to forget and act like we do not know God. And one of the most prevalent ways that's happening in our time is through the new American religion of identity politics. Regardless of how many politicians may invoke the name of God, this is a pagan religion, and we must reject its idols. Because our identity, friends, is not in an earthly political party. And it's, not, it's certainly not in the candidates. Have you seen them? Okay? Our true citizenship is in the kingdom of God, and our identity is in our King, Jesus. Now, um, my card's on the table. I've said this before. I'm not ashamed of it. My personal preferences when it comes to politics are conservative, okay? I'm glad to live in a country where brave men and women have fought to maintain my right to vote. Daniel certainly didn't have that. And when I vote, I vote for conservatives who I think will do the best job at preserving some semblance of my biblical values. I'm not saying you have to do that. Just That's my cards on the table. However, here's something else. The Bible informs me that it is a rare occurrence for God's people to have a king or a governor who does what is right in the eyes of the Lord. The vast majority of them do what is wicked in the eyes of the Lord. They worship Baal, the God who glorifies sexual immorality. Or they worship Molech, the God who glorifies child sacrifice. Or they worship Mammon, the God who glorifies monetary wealth. But at the end of the day, Daniel and so many who went before and after him show us that we don't have to be afraid of living in crazy times with wicked rulers. We can live with confidence, knowing that our God is sovereign even over our kings. As Daniel said in his prayer, it's God. It is God who sets up and removes kings. And furthermore, Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Romans 13.1, There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So while earthly kings may control many aspects of the culture we live in and the circumstances that we face, God is in absolute control of our kings. And you may think, well, if God is sovereign over our kings and political leaders, then why are they so bad? And to that question, I would say, are you paying attention to the book of Daniel? (laughs) God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8. The Lord has good purposes behind all things, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Proverbs 16, 4. And in Jeremiah 27, 6, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. The point is this. No king, no matter how powerful, no matter how wicked, is able to operate outside the bounds of God's sovereignty. For when they lift their hands to do evil, God has already determined to work it all out for good. More on that in a few minutes. But for now, I know it's a wild political season It feels like more bad things are on the horizon every day. But we don't have to lose our minds, church. We have a sovereign God. And so we can live confidently in these crazy 
times. That said, let's define confidence based on Daniel's example, because unfortunately, it seems many have conflated confidence with, well, just being a jerk, okay? So learning from Daniel, I think we can say that Christian confidence is not arrogant or rude. It is humble and bold. Christian confidence is not arrogant or rude. It is humble and bold. Now, we've already touched on this a little bit last week, but every time Daniel speaks, the dude is just like a master class, okay, on how to carry oneself as a Christian. So first off, the text reminds us that the king calls Daniel Belteshazzar, which is a name that praises the false pagan god Marduk. And so, as a very devout worshiper of Yahweh, the one true God, I'm just guessing here, going out on a limb, that Daniel probably didn't really appreciate that, right? But even though he knew he had the power and wisdom of God behind him, you know what he said to the king about that fake name? Nothing. He said, nothing. Why is that a big deal? Well, because some people in our culture need to learn the humble art of sometimes saying nothing. Some people live their lives in a state, more and more people actually live their lives in a state of outrage, perpetually looking for what is going to highly offend them next. And after every interaction they have, they have something critical to say about the other person. They leave thinking, I can't believe that person would say this. I can't believe that person would do that. And then you know what they do? They pull out their phone and they rant about it on the Crusty Word of Mouth Facebook page. (laughs) I know because I unfortunately am a member of that page. (laughs) And they use high and mighty language about how dumb and inconsiderate and offensive other people are as a way of exalting how perfect they think they are. Because perpetually offended people who want to lecture others on their fragile sensibilities all the time are actually prideful people. They're prideful people. But Christians are to be people who, because they have been humbled by God, are very difficult to offend. Christians should be very difficult to offend, especially in our dealings with non-believers. Why? Because we, church, church, we don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. We expect them to be exceedingly sinful, because they are. And so when they are, we're not like, (gasps) right? Like, no, this is Babylon, (laughs) okay? This is Babylon. Of course people are going to say things that you wouldn't say and do things that you wouldn't do. I'm not saying you should learn to like it, okay? I'm just saying as Christians, we should not walk around with our arms crossed and our nose turned up all the time, okay, ready to be offended. That's the first thing we see from Daniel's humility here. He's not offended by how poorly he has been treated by Nebuchadnezzar. None of us have been treated that poorly by anyone, okay? And he seems to understand that an arrogant pagan king is going to act like, newsflash, an arrogant pagan king. So he's not bothered by it, but in fact, even though he, he, he's bold in what he says, he's humble and he's willing to serve this king. Philippians 2 says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did now not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Church, Daniel is an Old Testament type or reflection of Christ in this way. Do you see that? While it seemed, while it seemed at the surface level, like Nebuchadnezzar was as exalted and as powerful 
as anyone could be, and that Daniel was as lowly and powerless as one could be. I think Daniel knew the truth. I think Daniel knew that spiritually he was rich and that Nebuchadnezzar was poor. And so he was able to not hold the king's ignorance against him, to not be offended by him, and maybe even to pity him, to feel sad for the state of his soul. But anyway, the the second thing about Daniel's humility is what sticks out most clearly, and it's that Daniel is totally, Daniel is totally unwilling to take any credit for what God was doing through him. Totally unwilling to take any credit. Nebuchadnezzar, it's actually kind of funny. Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel if he's able to tell the dream and its interpretation. And instead of even just saying yes, he, he like does verbal gymnastics. He, he totally defers the attention away from himself and uses the opportunity to tell this pagan king that indeed no man is able to tell him these things, but that the true God in heaven alone is able. And he says, Daniel says that um, this intel that, that he has has nothing to do with his own spectacular wisdom. It only has to do with the will of God to reveal this picture of the latter days to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, on the other hand, um, there is another minor character in this story. I don't know if you saw him. It's so brief. Arioch, the king's captain, who at the first opportunity to take credit for something, even though Daniel literally came to him, Arioch says to the king, I have found among the exiles a man who can tell you the interpretation. (laughs) And so I... I think the author intends for us to see that there are two kinds of confidence. Confidence in God and confidence in self. Confidence in self is arrogant, self-promoting, always looking for an opportunity to share a personal resume of all the good things that you have done. How blessed other people are to be around you. A desire to always speak up because you know all the answers and you know how to articulate them the best way. Confidence in God, on the other hand, is humble, always looking for an opportunity to praise and give glory back to God, always ready to remind others of the faithfulness of God despite your own inability, right? A slowness of speech, so as to not unintentionally draw the attention to yourself all the time. Daniel was confident in God, and as a result, he is humble. But he's also bold. He's also bold. That is, even though he knew that King Nebuchadnezzar did not believe in the God of Israel and had tried to indoctrinate Daniel into his Babylonian religion, and that Nebuchadnezzar was clearly unhinged enough to have Daniel killed for much less, Daniel did not hesitate to bear witness to what he knew to be true. That there really is one God in heaven, and his name is not Marduk, it is Yahweh. Pastor and author David Helm of Daniel's Humble Confidence says, the person who trusts in God fears no bad news, and so will boldly proclaim God's good news. What a great example to us in these crazy times of exile that we too are living in. Like Nebuchadnezzar, there are people all around us every day who are insecure, hostile, and on the brink of coming unhinged because they don't know God. Their idols have failed them and left them feeling hopeless and afraid, and they desperately need someone who is confident in the gospel to share it with them in humility and boldness. To tell them that more money, a better job, a different spouse, and even Donald Trump will not give them the lasting inner peace or comfort that they are longing for in this life. 
Because that can only come from a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Church, are we prepared for this? Are we prepared for this? Are we praying for this like Daniel did? That God would empower us to speak the truth in love to the people in our lives without fear of the relational repercussions. We live in a society that increasingly believes that faith is a private matter and that it should be kept to ourselves and that those who would dare evangelize are rude and insensitive. Church, these are all lies. These are lies that the spirit of Babylon has told Christians so that they would sit on the sidelines in the spiritual war and keep their mouths shut when they have the only message that people need to hear. The only message that can set people free from the slavery of sin. Let us reject. Let us reject the lies and be faithful messengers like Daniel and like the apostles in the fourth chapter of Acts, who when they are threatened with imprisonment, if they keep telling others about Jesus, they say, whether you think it's right or wrong, we cannot help but speak of what we know to be true. Christian confidence is not arrogant or rude. It is humble and bold. But all right, let's move on now from the character of the messenger to the content of the message. And uh, buckle up, because it's about to get deep. Um, (laughs) Daniel says, But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we'll tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom God The God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, whether they dwell, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you ruler over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle." As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they'll mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain, by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, whoo, indeed. (laughs) Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering, an incense, be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. 
and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. All right. Okay. So that's a lot, okay? Um, (laughs) And if you haven't spent time studying this passage before, at first it probably seems very obscure to you. But I think that as we dig in, it's actually going to make a lot of sense. All right, so Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that this giant statue in his dream of a mighty man, a warrior, if you will, with four parts made out of four different kinds of metal represents what will be in the latter days. That Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold uh, in the present historical moment, but that after Babylon, another kingdom that is inferior to them is going to come into power. Now, I'm no expert in prophecy, but the good news is that prophecies are usually a lot better understood in retrospect after they've come to fulfillment in history. So this lesser kingdom represented by the chest and arms of silver is Medo-Persia. And we know that because even in the book of Daniel, we see this transition take place. Now, while the Old Testament doesn't speak explicitly of the third kingdom represented by the waist and thighs of bronze, we know historically that Alexander the Great, who ruled over the Greek Empire, eventually took over this number one geopolitical spot. And interestingly enough, his kingdom was referred to as the kingdom of bronze because of the prevalence of the Greek army's military equipment being forged from what? Yes, bronze. But finally, Daniel says will come the kingdom of iron, the strongest metal of the group represented by the legs of the statue. History tells us that this was none other than the Roman Empire that would rise into power after the Greeks and be dominant in the world for the better part of 1,500 years. They indeed crushed all who came before them, as Daniel said shattering every nation they came into contact with and incorporating them into their massive domain of nearly 5 million square kilometers covering parts of three continents, Africa, uh, Asia, and Europe. But then Daniel says something peculiar. You're like, that's all peculiar. No, this is more peculiar. (laughs) That this final kingdom would have a fatal flaw, a clear weakness, that the legs of iron would have feet of iron mingled together with clay. And thus, it would be incredibly strong in some ways, but also incredibly vulnerable in others. Now, this is fascinating, because hundreds of years before the rise of the Roman Empire, and over a thousand years before Rome's decline, God tells Nebuchadnezzar, through the teenage prophet Daniel, that regardless of the insane size and strength of Rome, it would eventually grow too large to govern itself and be shattered to pieces. And as if God's clear foreknowledge of all things long before they ever come to pass is not amazing enough, it gets better and significantly more exciting. Daniel says that as Nebuchadnezzar was seeing this great statue, a massive stone that was cut by no human hand comes and collides with the feet of the statue and it falls down and smashes into pieces and blows away in the wind like chaff. And the stone begins to grow into a mountain that spreads out over the whole earth. And Daniel says, this mountain is the unshakable kingdom of God that would never come to an end. So um, I don't know if you have any guesses on who this stone is, but let me give you some hints. Psalm 118.22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus, it says, Jesus, he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Isaiah chapter 2 says, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. 
And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Psalm 48 says a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of who? The city of the great king. Are you figuring this out? Acts 4.11 says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Now, do you guys remember when I told you last week that God does not give dreams that don't have to do with his mission? Nebuchadnezzar's dream is about the coming of Jesus, about his incarnation, his life, his death, and his resurrection that would radically alter the course of human history. How could Daniel have known these things? Well, as he said, it's because he knew God. And every event in the course of human history is intentionally ordained by God for the good of his people and ultimately the glory of Christ. Every event in the course of human history is intentionally ordained by God for the good of his people and ultimately the glory of Christ. Isaiah 46, God says this, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, Things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Earlier we said that the reason God sometimes allows for wicked rulers is because he has a good purpose behind all things, that he works all things together for good, as Romans 8.28 says. Now, I want you, you're like, I've thought a lot already, Tad. I want you to think with me about this mind-blowing reality in the context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Babylon was a great kingdom. We know that. Medo-Persia was a great kingdom. Greece was a great kingdom. But something revolutionary happened when Rome came into power. These ancient eastern kingdoms before Rome were known for conquest, as we discussed in the first sermon of this series. They were constantly trying to get leverage over one another, to overtake each other and to absorb each other's territories. But when Rome took over, they were able to achieve something that no other nation had achieved to that point, an extended period of peace. Right? Their power was uncont- uncontested, and they were unbeatable. This time frame was called Pax Romana, Roman peace. And during this period, the Roman Empire flourished economically and administratively with major infrastructure projects, trade expansions, and cultural development. It provided a stable environment for the growth of cities and the facilitation of safe travel, largely through what avenue? History lesson Roman roads. The Roman road system was an engineering marvel. It spanned over 250,000 kilometers, and it was so well constructed that many of the roads remained in use even after Rome had fallen, and some of these roads still serve as the foundations of modern roads today. Why am I telling you this? Well, because Every event in the course of human history is intentionally ordained by God for the good of his people and ultimately the glory of Christ. And in his infinite wisdom, Jesus was born when what earthly kingdom was in power? Rome. When for the first time in human history, There was an incredibly reliable and incredibly expansive system for the spread of the gospel. How appropriate that Rome 
is the legs and the feet of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as the majority of Jesus' earliest disciples and missionaries would take the good news on these Roman roads from town to town. Jesus tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, that it's not for us to know future times and seasons, but that God the Father has lined them all up in his sovereign authority. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is proof of that. Amen? Amen. Are you still awake? All right. So maybe, some, maybe here's what's happened. Some of you have never thought about this before, and your mind is blown right now, okay? God loves to blow people's minds with the unsearchable riches of his wisdom and glory that they might humble themselves before him. And that same thing happens with Nebuchadnezzar, this formidable king, when Daniel tells him his exact dream and what it means, he fell on his face and declared, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Now, stay with me because we're almost done. You've invested a lot. The text says in verse 48, Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And get this, chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. First of all, I know we talked about this earlier, but this is for free. Um, If you have been a self-promoting person, always trying to exude confidence in yourself and a desire to get ahead Daniel shows us that it's always better to humble yourself and be confident in God because God will take care of your position when he sees fit and he's way better at orchestrating promotions than we are. Ariok, for example, the king's captain, promotes himself and we never hear about him again. Daniel never promotes himself and gives glory to God alone. And he becomes one of the most famous men in biblical history. So do with that what you will. But Daniel comes into a position of authority over all the wise men of Babylon at the beginning of the exile. Fast forward 600 years, Daniel has long passed. The once grand kingdom of Babylon is no more. Jesus is born into a province of the Roman Empire. And a couple years after Jesus is born, we read in Matthew 2 that some unusual visitors show up. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. (laughs) Seems to me that this is evidence that when Daniel was put in charge, he changed the curriculum at the University of Babylon. (laughs) And this just, just once more goes to show every event in the course of human history is intentionally ordained by God for the good of his people and ultimately the glory of Christ. Do you see it? Israel may have gone into Babylon because of their disobedience, but God intended for them to be there that the Babylonian people might repent and learn about the obedience of faith in Christ, which they did. Friend, I don't know what's going on in your life right now. Maybe it seems confusing. Maybe it feels meaningless. Maybe you're like, Crestview's lame. Why am I stuck here? I assure you, it's not meaningless. It's not meaningless. And that the God of history has a redemptive purpose and plan for you in all of it. And like Daniel, regardless of your current position, you have influence over someone in your life. Maybe instead of moping and complaining about how difficult things are, you need to change your perspective to see that your words and your actions have the ability to influence the eternal destinies of people who are far from God. That you have the ability 
by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to call people up onto the mountain where they too can meet the true God of heaven, Jesus Christ, and become a citizen of his unshakable kingdom. My final point today is this. The eternal kingdom of Christ will and has already begun to subvert, surpass, and supersede every earthly man-centered kingdom. That's really what this statue represents, isn't it? The kingdoms of man. Now Jesus, the divine cornerstone, was cut by the hand of God into history, and it didn't go the way that we might have predicted based on Daniel's prophecy. As the stone, he was supposed to come in and break the feet of clay of this mighty empire, and yet he wound up crucified by it. (laughs) Well, it turns out that Jesus' kingdom doesn't have to advance and usurp by physical force. It can do so by the sheer revelation of his supremacy. (laughs) As the message of Jesus' resurrection shot out like a cannon and continues to reverberate throughout and lovingly redeem the lives of people of nearly every tribe, tongue, and nation in the world today. The mighty Roman kingdom of iron that seemed too big to fail, as Daniel predicted, has since come to nothing. And since then, new empires have come into power and subsequently faded into the pages of history with all the rest And yet the kingdom of God is standing stronger than ever. Though this great mountain is not yet present to the naked eye, it continues to show its dominance over the kingdoms of man, internally subverting them by transforming their citizens into ambassadors for Christ who live for the values and the initiatives of the king of heaven. Their devotion to him surpassing all worldly commitments and their earthly achievements superseded by their new status as children of God. The eternal kingdom of Christ will and has already begun to subvert, surpass, and supersede every earthly man-centered kingdom. So let me close with this because I'm losing my voice. (laughs) The story of Nebuchadnezzar is not over yet. Though he is amazed by Daniel and Daniel's God, and he is willing to place Daniel in a high position for his own benefit, this worldly king has no intentions of submitting to God personally. There's a difference, you see, between being intrigued by God and actually worshiping him. Without getting too far into it, God is not done working in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar and giving him an opportunity to change course in a spiritual sense. But nevertheless, even in this first encounter, I think the message is clear. You can have the stone as your foundation, or you can have it as your destruction. You may have the stone as your foundation, or you can have it as your destruction. There is no third option when it comes to Jesus. There's no third other way, as the kids say. And as the psalmist says, you can either be drawn up from the miry bog and have your feet set on the rock in the security of salvation, or you can foolishly reject him and be crushed underneath it in damnation. I do not say this to be harsh. I say it as humbly as I can in love because it's the truth. Your man-centered kingdom, no matter how great it may seem right now, will come to an end. And the kingdom of Christ alone will stand. And you have the opportunity now to abandon the temporal and begin living for what is eternal. Because King Jesus has done for you what no other king has or would ever do. The wicked kings of earth say to their people, you go out 
and fight my war unto death that I might be exalted. But Jesus said, I came down from glory to fight your war unto death that you might be saved and exalted with me. He died on the cross to pay for your sin, but now he's seated on the throne. And the king's hand of fellowship is open to you today. All you have to do is repent of your sin, turn your back on the dying kingdom of Babylon, and trust him in faith. Take it from Daniel. (laughs) Take it from Daniel. Though I am the one speaking to you today, it's actually the great God of heaven who's making these things known to you. And take it from the fallen kings of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. When God speaks, you can be sure it's certain. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You are the God of all history, and you are the great revealer of mysteries. We thank you, Father, that from the beginning, you have declared the things that would come in the end. God, though we are sinful and broken men and women, God, even from the beginning, from the first sin, you made it clear that you were going to send a Savior. You were going to make a way for us to be made right with you again. And thank you, God, that we don't have to hear about this dream and this prophecy and be confused like Nebuchadnezzar. We know who the stone is now. We know it's Jesus. And we see his kingdom being built. And so, Father, I pray that if there's anyone in here today who has not yet taken up the king, the good king, on his offer to come into the kingdom by faith alone, that they would do so today. And for the rest of us, God, please empower us by your spirit. Help us to live in humble boldness as we navigate this crazy world together for the glory of Christ until he returns to take us home. It's in his name we pray. Amen.